Hello, Alan Steady, a network architect with Firewalls.com, here to provide another how-to video. This time we're here in the studio with our 4860E, and we will be walking through getting started. So currently I have my 48 physical connections to both our LAN, which is port 1, and WAN interfaces. The LAN interface is labeled, again, as port 1 on this particular model, and the WAN interface I'm connected to is labeled as WAN 1. Before we get started, it is important to first make the decision on how the FortiGate will be operating within our environment. There are two operation modes that the appliance can be placed in, either a NAT or transparent mode. The NAT mode is our more common operating mode, where the FortiGate is placed into a Layer 3 route mode, and where we can assign IP addresses to our interfaces and packets are routed via IP addresses. When placed in a transparent mode, the FortiGate appliance is simply acting in Layer 2 bridge mode where our interfaces will not have IP addresses assigned to them and packets are not routed but forwarded. In our example, we'll be dropping this in using the more common NAT operation mode. Our first order of business here is going to be establishing our connection to our FortiGate appliance. By default, the port 1 IP address is 192.168.1.99 and on a slash 24 network subnet. And DHCP is configured and enabled by default on this port. Therefore, once you are physically connected to port 1, as I am in this example, we will automatically be assigned an IP address on this network to begin our configurations. In the event you have your network card statically assigned, you will need to make the adjustment to DHCP or reconfigure it to be on the 192.168.1.0 network. There are some additional default settings that will allow us to begin management that are all associated with port 1 and those being ping, HTTP, HTTPS, as well as SSH for terminal CLI configurations. Having these facilities enabled by default is what's going to allow us to begin our configuration. To get started here, we'll need to open up a web browser, as this tutorial will be based around using the GUI as opposed to a CLI. So here in our browser, what we're going to do is we're going to navigate to an HTTPS colon slash slash 192.168.1.99. Getting started here, our default username and password are admin, and currently there will be no password associated with our FortiGate appliance. So we'll just go ahead and select login, where we're now prompted to change the password. You can also skip this step. However, it is highly recommended that we go ahead and set a nice, strong password. Should you decide to skip the step, you can always update the password once we're logged in. Now we're going to log in using our new password. It is important to keep in mind that whatever you use um, to log in for your admin and password, it is case sensitive. So just make sure we're entering in our credentials using the correct format. Now, since this is a new appliance, we can go ahead and register our FortiGate with the FortiCare as it is required. However, in order to do this, you do have to have the ability to reach the internet, which in most cases will require additional configurations. So in this example, I'll go ahead and select later. And we're going to include a link in the comment section below to a separate video which will guide you through registering the appliance. So here in our main dashboard we can see some system information along with our licensing details and there are several other widgets as you can see here. We won't dive too in depth into that at this time. So the first thing that we're going to do is go ahead and, and configure our WAN interface which will give us the internet access and allow our firewall to be registered and synchronized with FortiCare. So we'll do that over here under network and selecting interfaces and we'll need to modify our WAN interface. We can do that by highlighting the WAN and selecting Edit. Alternatively, you can just double click this. And you can see that in my example here, we are currently set up with our upstream gateway being in a, a NAT mode where it's providing DHCP to us on our WAN. This is a fairly common setup that we see with a lot of our customers uh, in the small business space. However, if you do have a statically assigned IP address being issued to you from your ISP, you'll just select manual here and enter in those IP details. If you're unsure about the IP details, you can always contact your service provider to obtain them. We're going to leave this set to DHCP. And before we start making any changes, we'll start up here at the top with alias. This is just a name that we can give to the interface or our port. This is helpful in scenarios where we may have more than one WAN interface. So from an identification standpoint, it's always a good idea to give these a name. The name can be anything from perhaps your service provider. So if you have a Comcast or AT&T or Spectrum, um, you can name that. Or 
If you're going to shoot certain types of traffic out different gateways, you could go that route. So if this was like a fiber data connection versus a VoIP designated connection, whatever makes most sense for you in your particular setup. I will go with our ISP here. We'll just call this Spectrum. We can see that our link status is in the up state, which just means it has a physical connection to it. You can see that our type is a physical interface. It's not a VLAN or anything like that. And then here in our estimated bandwidth, we have an upstream and downstream, so our upload or download speeds. This is important for QoS or bandwidth management should you decide to implement those. We'll cover those in greater details in separate videos. In our tag here, we're going to leave the role set to WAN. And as mentioned, because this is DHCP, it's already pulled its IP information from our upstream router or modem. So from here, what's important that we obtain is our default gateway. We're going to use this in a later step uh, to configure our route, which is important for us to be able to actually reach the internet. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy that here. Before I move on, it's worth mentioning that just because the upstream router or device is providing you DHCP, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to leave it set to DHCP. And in some cases, you may not want to do that. So what you can do is leave it set to DHCP, so it's going to be assigned an available IP, and then come over here and set it to manual or a static, which is just going to mean that this WAN IP is not going to change. As you can see, there are some additional advantages to having a static IP from an administrative perspective, where we can add admin access, such as HTTPS, SSH, and ping for monitoring purposes. And there are also some additional options, as you can see here. So oftentimes when we have a static IP address, we might enable some of these administrative access functions. Just keep in mind the security implications related to exposing WAN access. So if you have a strict compliance or regulation needs, this may not be a good idea to implement. However, there are ways that we can add some security to reduce our exposure and risks. The first being you know, creating a strong and complex password. Also defining access controls on the sources that are able to to reach us. And for a more complex solution, you can always add multi-factor authentication. For the sake of our video here, I'm going to leave this set for DHCP and select OK. So next we need to configure our static route or our default route so we can reach the internet. We'll do that over here under network and static routes followed by create new. Since this is our default route, we're going to leave this destination alone. This is basically saying anything that the firewall is unsure about, we're going to send that up to the gateway address. And we'll go ahead and enter in our gateway address. And we could select OK. Before I move on, I will point out here this interface dropdown will allow us to select our WAN interface where we can see that alias that we added earlier is listed and how that can be useful. And if we select this, it's actually going to pre-populate the gateway for us. And we can say OK. The next default function that we're going to talk about is our firewall rules or our access controls, which we can access here via the policy and objects and IPv4 policies. You can see that there are a couple of default policies already defined for us. So from a firewall hardening perspective, we can end up spending quite a bit of time here. And by default, we can also see that none of our security services are actually activated. So if we want to apply any level of security scanning, we will need to kick these on. These do require licensing and a valid security subscription contract, which can be added and synchronized to our FortiGate appliance. We always want to make sure that we're logging the traffic, and we'll give this policy a name, which we'll just call our default allow. This is actually a fairly common policy that a lot of organizations will use as a catch-all and position this at the bottom of our rule stack. However, from a firewall hardening perspective, it's always a good idea to come back and create more purpose-driven policies that are more specific to your organizational or business needs. Say OK. Now we can see that our default policy is in place. We've added the default security profiles, which we'll take deeper dives in in separate videos. So now we would be ready to complete our registration and finish the synchronization with FortiCare. If you found this video helpful, be sure to give us a thumbs up below and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you're notified of future video releases. And be sure to come and check us out at firewalls.com. It's www.firewalls.com. Thanks for watching.